I'm going to announce it officially here on Gore Nation. Daniel Vadnall Fitness FAQs is shelving the planche. Full planche is not on the agenda. I'm very satisfied with the straddle planche. Yo, Gorillas, welcome to the Athlete Insider Podcast by Gore Nation. My name is Phil, and today's guest is the one and only YouTuber, Fitness FAQs, Daniel from Fitness FAQs. I'm extremely happy to have you on the show. Somebody with a master's degree in physiotherapy, an athlete himself with over 10 years of experience, and uh, yeah, somebody who influences calisthenics athletes all over the world since a lot of years. I'm really happy to welcome you to the show. Daniel, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Phil. Excited to chat. True. I'm also really looking forward to this. Uh, it's been a long time that we talked last time. Uh, I see that it's uh, quite cold, quite uh, winter, winterish <laughs> in Australia. So uh, yeah, how are you these days? Everything's good? Yeah, I've been traveling well. Won't bore everyone too much with the details, but uh, in Melbourne, Australia right now, we're on a, another lockdown. So probably another oh. week or so of lockdown here, but oh. otherwise all good. Okay, cool. So you use the time right. Uh, you you try to maximize uh, the the time uh, that you spend in, yeah. in the office, I guess. Yeah, the usual stuff everyone's heard over and over again. Control your controllables. Trying to get some good leisure time, and of course, some calisthenics in the mix. <laughs> also. Great. Um, yeah, let's start with the hard facts. Uh, even though you share a lot of um, and you are a really transparent person, uh, there are still some questions about the hard facts. How old are you? I am 28. So my birthday is 19th of October, 1992. Okay. So if you want to collect some uh, some karma points, you can put this into your calendar right now and then you can... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can shoot I'm Daniel. I'm expecting some extra Instagram messages now. <laughs> awesome. How heavy are you right now? I am around 83 kilos and 183 centimeters. Okay. And uh, yeah, you already said the last question, how tall? Perfect. Um, yeah, let's uh, start. Give us a little bit of perspective. How did you get in touch with the sport? How was your first uh, first calisthenics touch point? Yeah, sure. So I started calisthenics when I was uh, 17 years old in 2009. And my introduction to the pastime activity sport, if you will, was through YouTube. So One day, just for whatever reason, in the early days of YouTube, I came across some calisthenics videos, as most people did in the early days uh, from New York. So the Barbarians, Hannibal for King, calisthenics, uh, calisthenic kings, those type of guys that were just in incredible shape doing the basics with just their body weight. And I remember just being instantly intrigued by what I saw and like most people rushed out to the park and uh, did not perform as well as what I saw on the videos and didn't look as gracious, of course. But over time, you see a little bit of improvement. So you, you can do a few more pull-ups, you can do a few more dips, you can do a few more push-ups. You start to notice you've got a little bit of a bicep muscle growing there and some chest and some shoulders and After seeing that initial progress in the first few months as a 17-year-old, I've been training calisthenics ever since. Wow. For me, like I'm into, into the calisthenics game myself since 2013, 2014. For me, it feels already like you are some of uh, one of the, the early calisthenics uh, people, calisthenics influencers. But we have to remember that in 2009, when you started, there were already like uh, Zef uh, Zaccavelli, who is just uh, one name. Yeah. Uh, he was already performing on a high level. Like I, I also asked him in an interview with him, since how long did you do calisthenics? And he was like, uh, since to, uh, 19, 1996. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's wow, like, that's it's, like a lot more, like the time when most people were born or maybe even, you know, before then for most yeah. people. That's true. So it, for me, it feels like when you started in 2009, it's already so long ago, but then there are still people like the Calisthenics Kings, like the Barbarians, people who are like uh, performing already on a really high level in these times. So um, yeah, interesting. Um, 
when you started with calisthenics, what were your goals? Was it to build uh, muscle mass? Was it to learn some cool skills or to impress the girls? Like what was the, the main uh, motive, uh, be motivation behind it? A good question. In, in the initial days, I was doing parkour at the time. So while I was doing parkour, I was mainly to improve my, my body weight strength to be able to do wall climbs, et cetera, better. But then over time, I found that I was less interested in the parkour side of things and more just in the calisthenics. And that's when I started to get more into just improving the basics. So better, better muscle ups, uh, start practicing handstands and learning some strength skills with handstands like press to handstand, handstand push-ups, and just building it from there. So just continuing with weighted calisthenics and just essentially building the basics. Okay. So today I mainly know you for really controlled calisthenics, slow uh, movements, controlled, really good form, etc. cetera. So um, you, your beginning was in, in parkour. W were you the, the, the explosive guy, somebody who was like, who had ex good, really explosive strength and who did uh, dynamics and like, how can we imagine the Daniel doing parkour? <laughs> that's a good question too yeah i'd say so i think that's just a part of the evolution of training i find that most people when they're teens to early 20s to 30s i find that people go from being more explosive reckless and dynamic with their training approach because you can get away with anything your, your body responds to anything and everything and i think that just over time you start to approach things Uh, a little bit more calculated, a little bit more sustainable. Um, and I think that's just the natural progression for me over time. Um, I've always gravitated more towards the, like you just said, the more strict style of sets and reps, weight calisthenics. Me personally, doing the freestyle stuff has never really interested me. Like I can see why people do enjoy it because it's pretty impressive to watch. Uh, but for me personally, I just find it more fulfilling just hitting the basics, man. Same here. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, let's switch to today. Um, how does your workout schedule look like today for a week? Like, um, it depends. I know that you're a really accurate, uh, scientific uh, person. So it depends on you if you want to show, like, sh uh, tell us a simplified version or really go into detail. I think people would appreciate both. Okay. Yeah. This, this is a tough question to go into detail and provide a lot of value for people because I'm sure most people that you interview say a similar thing. It's what works for me is not going to work for other people. They're at a different point in their journey, uh, different time commitment they can uh, put into their training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Phil, for the last uh, one and a half years, I've actually transitioned more to a mobility focus And calisthenics has taken a little bit of the back burner. So I'd say for the last year, I've been pretty dedicated on improving, probably not a position that's as familiar in calisthenics, but it's called the back bridge. Are you familiar with that movement? Yeah. Back the, bridge. Yeah, of course. You, know, right. you, you go backwards. Yeah, yeah. So the reason for that, I'm, I'm sure people listening probably, well, what's he talking about? Why, why would he be doing that when he's doing calisthenics? <laughs> Because I spent uh, a good five to eight years as I just said, on the basic movements, planche, front lever, one arm, chin up, weighted, weighted basics. And that's awesome. You, you build some good strength with what your body can do. You build some good aesthetics. But I found that I was getting so jacked that my mobility was very restricted. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, your mobility is dependent on what you do and what activities that you, you're trying to get out of your body. But I found that wanting to work on more advanced things, like a more like a gymnastics press to handstand, like a stall to press, requires certain attributes that calisthenics wasn't giving me. I found that when I wanted to work on one arm handstands, because my shoulders were so closed and my lats were so tight from being able to do these heavy chins and pulls, that I, I was just restricted with what I can do. So Basically, I've been a beginner for the last one and a half years and I've uh, made a pretty big transformation, which I'll be sharing with people probably pretty soon after this podcast. So hopefully that motivates people on their journey. 
Um, so as an answer to your question, what does my training split look like these days? Last year and a half, it was pretty heavy on the mobility at the start of my workouts and the calisthenics was coming secondary. So I would have been doing a back bridge fake focused strength mobility stuff three days a week and calisthenics in a upper body workout session three days a week and just legs once a week. So if you look at that, that's seven, seven sessions in a week. Okay. And did you feel that your strength, that you lost your strength? Because I would say a fear that a lot of people have doing mobility is that they fear losing the strength and the stiffness that you need for some uh, uh, movements like the planche, I would say, like, maybe you can correct me, but. No, you are a hundred percent correct. I definitely lost strength and you almost nailed it just straight away. So you do benefit from having stiffness in your muscles when you're trying to demonstrate your max strength. So if someone wanted to perform at the highest level in calisthenics, then having really open shoulders and you know, quote unquote flexible muscles would not serve that goal as well. But I'm sure with what people have been following with fitness FAQs, we know we've got a very uh, more moderate approach to what we're teaching. So like calisthenics is the base with the body weight strength. Um, we're trying to build some muscle as well, but we want to have mobility to move freely too. So we're not going to set the world on fire in any one particular area, but I'm sure discussing with you, you can see that as you go through the journey of training, you start to gravitate more towards general abilities as opposed to specialization because each has a certain sacrifice. So to answer your question, Phil, yes, By training mobility, you're going to be taking steps back, but that's necessary to take steps forward. So what I mean by that is despite me getting weaker overall at the basic movements like handstand push-ups, weighted dips, weighted pull-ups, the reason for that is because now I'm training a further range of motion that I have to teach my muscles to get strong in. So in a way, now that I'm beginning to refocus again on my calisthenics because I've ticked my boxes of doing my side splits and my back bridge and stuff like that. It's somewhat good because I feel like I'm learning again, if that makes sense, because the challenge of improvement feels like I'm trying to teach my body how to gain strength in this new range. So it's, it's fun, man. It's a good challenge. Wow. Wow. I have to think of gymnasts because gymnasts are strong in mobility, I would say. Like um, we can't generalize everybody, but like the the, the gymnast uh, that I have in front of my eyes is uh, somebody who is really flexible, who has like, uh, I know these uh, crazy stretches that they do for gymnastics, um, for the shoulder mobility, et cetera. But they are also extremely strong and they can do planches and Maltesers, et cetera. Is that exactly the thing, say, uh, the thing that you said, that they train the strength in, in the whole mobility, like in this uh, whole range of motion? Definitely. So a lot of gymnasts are fortunate to do both when they first start. If there's one nugget of advice that I can give any young athletes or calisthenics people, or just anyone that's listening to this, it's to work on using a full range of motion from day one. If your priority isn't to set world records, then you're going to save yourself so much time if you just do your pull-ups with a full range of motion, going into the hang, doing your um, overhead pressing movements like your pipe push-ups, not with this complacent closed angle at the top, going all the way to the top. Um, I believe that's why the gymnast can display both, whereas I'm probably in the position that a lot of people that have been training for a few years slash adults are in, in the respect that they've done their basics, got really strong, built some muscle, but haven't really paid their dues, so to speak, with their mobility stuff. Okay. That's, that's really interesting because, uh, yeah, mobility is something that I think is uh, essential if you want to perform uh in, still perform in 20 years, 30 years, uh, 40 years. I see a lot of people who have like extreme problems with mobility when they become older. Um, 
Uh, I don't know if you, by any chance, read the biography of uh, David Goggins, um, who also uh, at the end is an extremely interesting uh, part where he talks about how mobility, like a lack of mobility nearly killed him. Like that's, this is an extreme example, but he had like extreme health problems, uh, which uh, got solved yeah. by somebody uh, who showed him how to stretch properly. And he didn't do... Uh, 10 stretches for um, a few minutes, but he did, I think he only did two or three stretches, but for, for two hours. Um, and this helped him <laughs> to get out of this. Maybe that's an extreme thing that you're laughing. I think that's not the, uh, the, the, the scientific way. He, the, the Don't guys get me are... started, man. Don't get me started. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think what you're saying is, is something that everyone listening needs to hear. It's the sustainability and longevity yeah, doing PRs and doing your new personal records are awesome. They should be your objective long-term, but the sustainability of being able to do this stuff we love until we choose to stop is what I want. What I feel that I, I hate hearing the stories of athletes or just people really passionate about their training that are forced to stop because they can't, because they've got – golfer's elbow because they've been doing too much too soon. They've got some uh, acute injury because they're entering a range of motion they don't have strength for. The list goes on. but And it's not a really sexy topic to talk about, but longevity is something that I think that all people that have a following or a voice should be just drilling, really drilling home. And you hear a lot of calisthenics athletes, like competitive uh, athletes, or like just on a on a on a above average level, who say, "Yeah, if you have pain in the shoulder, just work around it. Uh, work, uh, do exercise that don't hurt." Like, what is maybe what are the things that you see in the calisthenics scene and the calisthenics uh, athletes out there? Um, what are the mistakes that people do um, concerning injuries and overtraining and all of all of this? I think there's a lot of complexity when it comes to how do you make a training program? Even the earlier question you asked me is probably going to confuse people with my training split because it didn't really give a concrete answer. But I feel people can take away is just writing down your training. You can forget about periodization, all this stuff. Yeah, it works. It's, it's something that smart training is about and you can get into that stuff. But for the average person, it's more just about what did you do previous session? What did you do previous week? How has your training built up over time? Because you can see why people tend to make mistakes in the calisthenics culture because we're training outdoors with our friends and we're just going just quote unquote beast mode for three hours many times a week. And that environment is awesome for pushing yourself to new limits. But the downside is you're not really tracking. You're not measuring. One week, you might be doing 40% more training load when we know that you should be doing in 5% to 10% increments, as an example. But if you track down what you're doing, even if you just have it as a mere reflection, that is really going to help you avoid mistakes and just, I guess, look from the outside in at what you're actually doing with your training. Because we all know it's hard to remember what we actually did last session, last week. But if you've got it written down, then you can manage your training load a bit better. True. And for me, you're really one of the most extreme people in, in measuring in, in a good way. Don't, don't take it, uh, don't take it uh, negatively. But uh, like, uh, I think a few months or weeks ago, you also shared about measuring your planche progress, uh, which is quite difficult because it's, uh, if you, I, I would say if you film it, it's still quite a subjective um, view. It's uh, like um, hard to, how to, how to measure, you change angles, you change, uh, yeah, doesn't matter but your planche lean you uh, put a a, a line uh, like a centimeter how is it called in english the the thing to to measure distance yeah measuring tape a measuring tape uh, at the wall and then you tried uh, to lean forward as much as possible touch the uh, wall with your head and measure your planche progress right yes now like you just said that is an extreme example and that's not to say that that's, that's correct or it's better than your method. It's just an alternative. So 
as long as if the person is measuring in some capacity and that's a repeatable way of measuring, that's perfect. So in your example, if someone sets their camera up and uses the same wall, same type of setup, they can clearly compare the two. That's perfect. And if they use a tape measure, if they want to really geek out, they can, they can also do that too. But moral of the story is you are measuring and that serves to track your training load. But I think more importantly, it serves to motivate you because especially with social media these days, we can see our planche against the wall and we're struggling and we're like not really that far from the wall and we can get very deflated with that. And in terms of if we compare ourselves to other people, but if you compare that to what you did three to six months ago, you'd be like, geez, damn, I've actually been making some progress. So use that as reflection. Your own progress is very important. May I ask, um, how do you deal with comparison? Because um, like we uh, did the questions, et cetera, and there were people um, asking, um, yeah, why uh, why don't you do a full planche? Like, I guess that's a question that people also ask you in DM, or uh, why don't you do Iron Cross, Hefesto, uh, all, the, all the crazy skills that I would say. Um, You, do you also have this problem of comparing yourself to competitive athletes or to exceptional athletes or specialized as athletes, I would call them? Um, do you also have that? I guess why I've got experience with answering that question is because I've had to go through that process myself. So to, to be fair, these days, I try not to compare myself to other people because it's human nature. We, we do it to an extent, but I try not to bog myself down in it because you don't know what the person's history is. You don't know what they're doing, what they're not doing to be able to achieve what they're looking for. Um, and the second part of your question in terms of why am I not doing advanced elements like that? This is the difficult thing with the, the social media content, which is why a podcast like this is, is awesome for people that have a good attention span. They can hear the, the answer to some of this stuff. Um, it's difficult to justify your training at all times over a 10 year period. You know what I'm saying? Because people might see me post me training the planche in 2014. It's like, hey, bro, where's that full planche? <laughs> But I've, I've, like I'm going to tell you now, it's, it's one of those skills for me. I had a goal of a certain point. So I wanted to achieve a straddle planche while still doing other training styles like squatting heavy, still doing weighted calisthenics. And that was the box that I had to tick for myself. So in that respect, when I achieved that goal, I was comparing my own progress to the goal that I set for myself. Sure, a straddle planche for five seconds is nothing in calisthenics. It's like there's, there's thousands of people that can do that quite easily, but there's only one me and there's only one me that did that based on my journey. So I guess that's what I'm trying to drill home for everyone that's that's listening. If you compare your own progress to yourself, that's all you've really got. Hmm. Well, that's uh, I already see this part in the motivational video because it's really it's it's true. Like uh, it's it's one hundred percent true, and uh, it's um, social media has a lot of upsides but uh, this is one big big up uh, downside uh, that people can fall into yeah. the the feeling that everybody can do a straddle planche but not me um and um yeah then also the things that you just said so yeah it's this it's this fine balance though so it's not like when you say don't compare yourself to others you just never watch what other people do that's mm -hmm. not the case it's like you need to get this balance of drawing inspiration oh, look, there's someone else who's 183 centimeters and around my weight and they're doing an exercise I'm trying to work towards. That's motivating. Cool. Okay, I'm going to leave and focus on myself and reflect on my own journey going forward. But I think that seeing other people doing things is definitely motivating if it's perceived in the right way, which is easier said than done. Yeah. So yeah, let's. Uh, you already talked about it. We talked about it. The planche. Um, so it's one big topic that we received a lot of questions for um, because um, still, like be with your uh, with your physique, I would say, uh, with your approach, etc. You you speak to a lot of people. You are quite heavy. You are quite tall for for a calisthenics athlete. Um, 
And um, yeah, you worked on it for a long time. I re really remember, as you said, like 2014, 15, yeah, uh, you yeah. working on the planche, uh, sharing your uh, your struggles with it, uh, be really being transparent with it. Um, and um, also, I would say, because I saw your head movement when you said you're quite tall, because uh, that's uh, a comment that I can imagine quite often. People saying, yeah, uh, 183, I think, uh, is, is, not that, is not that tall. Uh, like, because there are people People like uh, who are 190 or even two meters, two meters five, um, but um, still you were really transparent and maybe you can explain it for the people who didn't follow it back in the days or um, just summarize it. How did your plant journey go since 2014, 13 something? Okay, with the, with this journey, it was a ongoing pursuit of frustration because of a lack of training focus and also weight gain. So as we know with calisthenics, it's all about our relative strength, how strong we are at our own body weight. When I first started training the planche, not very focused. I was around 74 kilos. And then I was doing weighted calisthenics and going on a bulk and being in my prime, I guess, testosterone-fueled age of, say, like, 18 to 22. So I just, I went from that 74 to 90 ish kilos and throw in a few injuries along the way in terms of, you know, overuse injury to the shoulder with a rotator cuff tear, some injuries to the elbow from doing too much pulling volume, a, a ligament tear to my wrist from doing front squats and racking the bar. Um, the journey was definitely up and down in that respect. Um, what I found that was my biggest quote unquote mistake or error with the planche was trying to do too many things at once. So what I was doing, I was doing too many like weighted dips while at the same time trying to do handstand pushups whilst also trying to do 90 degree pushups. Oh yeah, let's do some heavy pulls. Let's do some front levers. You want to do some sets and reps? Let's do that too. <laughs> oh, but I also want to achieve the planche. So I'm sure this is a common, a common narrative for people doing calisthenics. So it took me as stubborn as most of us are, like a long time because of being self-coached to realize that um, you can only do so much at once. Um, and definitely the injuries were a blessing in disguise because it was like after that wrist injury, when I was front squatting, I was like, you had a good 12 weeks to really think and obviously not do any training. And I'm like, this time around, when I build up to this planche, I am not going to train like an absolute fool. I'm going to be very focused. The planche is going to be at the start of my session, not towards the middle or towards the end. And I really thought, I really took the mindset of not, what can I do more? What can I take away? And I think that that is something that's probably not taught enough, I guess, in calisthenics. It's always like there's this extra drill or maybe you should train an extra day. But in reality, like off, oftentimes it's just, it's simple. The simple stuff works. It's, it's the consistency. It's the patience. It's the focus. It's not doing too many exercises. It's like planche has got to be the focus on your pushing days and you've got to put everything else on the back burner. So when I had that stuff in mind, surprise, surprise, I started making progress. I was actually seeing improvement in terms of like my, my body shape improving over time, um, just actually seeing improvements in terms of hold times, um, how much volume that I can get away with. All of that stuff was improving. And I, after probably about a year of focused work, achieved that straddle planche. But I don't want people to think, oh, from being injured to planche, it's going to take a year. I believe that if you've had experience with a movement, um, you've taught your nervous system and your muscles in the past, it's easier to relearn a movement than it is from the start. But moral of the story is focus and think about what you can take away from your routine, not what you can add. Well, that uh, is... 
already sums up a lot of things, um, that a lot of questions that came after it. Um, one question was what boosted it? Uh, what did bring the breakthrough? Was it more volume, more frequency? Um, I think you just said focus, but maybe you want to yeah. add something. Um, Because, yeah, with that, what I mean is I already had the base of muscle mass. So a lot of people that do calisthenics have plenty of muscle in their, I guess, the planche pattern of movement. That it's just a matter of teaching your body how to own that position. So for me, that that year was more focused on the planche skill itself and less of the muscle building movements of the muscles involved in planche, like dips and handstand pushups, more planche stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you see um, in, in the majority of people, something that they should take care of? Like um, it, what's more most important? Is it wrist mobility? Is it, um, I don't know, shoulder, shoulder health mobility? Is it core strength that's lacking? Can you say something general or is it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one, but you'd have to say most people, it's got to be the scapular protraction. I think if no matter what exercise, what drill, if you are doing it with that nice um, position, that nice posture, that nice intention of that protraction, depression, straight arms, you're going to be winning. And I think that most of us tend to skip, I guess, the focus on that. Like we'll try and do a, a harder progression than we probably should. We start seeing some flaws in the technique. And I found that because I got injured, I really humbled myself in that process and The funny thing is when you do humble yourself in your training, you, you, you see better results. It's not going to be as instant or flashy in terms of highlight reels and whatnot. But I, I know that the, the actual like tuck planches, advanced tuck planches that I was doing, I was actually doing it with good protraction and depression as opposed to like, oh, let's try and flick myself into a straddle because I, I just want to get it. Sure. Okay. Um, another question that people ask, do you plan on unlocking the full planche? Is it something that's, um, is it something that you aim for in two years, three years, or is it something that you already told yourself? Yeah, it's not on the list. I'm going to announce it officially here on Gore Nation. <laughs> Daniel Vadnall, Fitness FAQs is shelving the planche. Full planche is not on the agenda. I'm very satisfied with the straddle planche. Just because it requires so much dedication to get it. I, I just, I, I, I don't want to say I'm going to go for it because I understand how hard it is to get. And especially uh, that I don't want to give up other aspects of my training to achieve that. Just because I think I'm slightly traumatized from not getting the planche and trying it. And then, you know, I've done it. I'm very satisfied with, with that process. So, no. Okay, so uh, no, no full planche in, in sight, um, the, which is uh, which is uh, a little bit sad, but uh, still understandable. Of course, uh, you have a lot of uh, focuses uh, in your training and a lot of goals. Um, but uh, yeah, for the people um, who want to learn the planche, the straddle planche, as you did, uh, which is a, a method that I would say um, is uh, is worth checking out because, um, as I said, like uh, with the with the weight, with your experience, with the uh, um, with the background that you have, uh, it might be really interesting. Is um, yeah that you also offer the uh, uh, planche program, a uh, program for for the straddle planche, and also a lot of uh, new other plans. I think the newest one is the the split side split. Uh, is it is it true? Yeah, correct. So just as as you could see, I wanted to dedicate myself last year to really putting my principles and methods into practice on myself. Um, and yeah, I've created Side Split Pro and coming soon, Backbridge Pro. But yeah, back to the interview. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, I I picked out a really interesting question somebody asked on YouTube, um, which is a um, little bit like a really um, specific question. Uh, Rico Nater three two one asked, uh, "Do you believe that ten to twenty hard sets a week work for calisthenics, like do my Dr. Mike Israel thinks, or is it more applicable to weightlifting and more volume work? Work is better for calisthenics." So um, yeah, did you ever hear about these ten twenty hard sets uh, in a week? Uh, and what is your opinion on that? This is a great question. And I believe that a general answer to this, you could say, would be no, 
for most people that are doing calisthenics. If you are doing purely weighted calisthenics and you're only doing heavy pull-ups, heavy dips, then that 10 to 20 range might make a bit more sense just because of the intensity. I think that based on what we spend most of our time doing with calisthenics in terms of strength skills through a full range, like front lever pulls or various other things we're doing, more moderate rep ranges, the intensity is just not high enough to fatigue us in that 10 to 20 range for most people. So I think a blanket answer to that would be that you can probably get away with more sets than that if it has been gradually built up to over time and it suits your level of development. Obviously, a complete beginner to calisthenics, 10 to 20 sets is probably going to be enough of a stimulus. But for someone that's been training for longer, maybe not so. And it would also depend, are you doing weighted calisthenics or are you doing just purely body weight? If you're more doing just the body weight side of things, you're going to need more, more sets to get that stimulus. Something that a lot of athletes say is progressive overload. That's often a keyword I say uh, that, that uh, falls in, in these interviews. What is your opinion on that? Oh, for sure. It's built in. Whether you think you're applying progressive overload or you're just training, you're, you're progressive overload. That's if you're doing more sets, more reps, if you're upping the, if you're changing the leverage of the exercise, you're progressing the exercise. So it's just the basic concept that we use in, in resistance training just to, to find that we're trying to seek improvements. Something that I see for a lot of beginners and also for myself for a long time was um, to train until real uh, and being happy about the extreme soreness next day and uh, like feeling oh, now if I eat right uh, now the, and if I sleep a lot, it will grow and I will uh, tomorrow I will be two times bigger. So um, what is your what is your point of view on, on soreness on um, yeah, going to the limit uh, in every training? Yeah, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think we can, most people tend to feel the same. It's like you feel like you've had a, a really solid session if you, if you feel sore and um, you, the target area has been worked. You can, you can guarantee that. But from what we know from the science at large, it's you don't need muscle soreness to grow. It's often a sign of um, either doing like heavy eccentrics. So if you're doing... Uh, let's say one arm chin up negatives, they're, they're very taxing and it causes a lot of muscle damage when you're doing negatives. So those type of exercises tend to cause the soreness. And um, if, if you're training to failure as well, it's, it's not a requirement for, for progressing either. So those, those two uh, uh, areas that aren't absolutely required to make progress. Is it maybe um, we have two people, uh, person A, person uh, two, uh, per, person A, person B, um, and person A trains every training. He trains uh, three times per week because he doesn't have too much time. He trains uh, to the maximum uh, to, uh, to, uh, to failure in every workout. Um, and person B trains uh, six times per week, but always is always uh, sticking with uh, 70% um, of, of uh, volume, no, uh, of like uh, intensity um, in, in, his, in his sets. Um, which person progresses quicker is that uh something that you can answer or is it too too uh... it's it's on a sliding scale essentially so you you can't train hard and a lot but you can train hard and infrequently so the person training two to three times a week and they just absolutely kill themselves might not be doing such a bad training plan because they've got so much time to recover but if you were to say Daniel, I want to train seven days a week as hard as I possibly can. And I'm going to do pull-ups every single day to failure. Is that good? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. So it's it, not, nothing's, nothing's black and white. There's, there's, a, there's a scale of intensity and volume. So if you're going to failure, you probably can't train as much. If you're training a little bit further from failure, you can go to a higher frequency. So I believe that the takeaway for most people is most people want to increase their strength. Most people want to increase their muscle mass. 
the the research at large shows that you're better off training with a, a moderate frequency, probably around two to three times per week for each muscle group, because that's a good amount of time for the stimulus and also the recovery. So one session a week where you're just training to failure or training every single day, same muscle group, plus or minus failure, aren't optimal. That's why most people tend to fall into that, you know, that happy middle ground, the non-sexy uh, moderation approach that no one wants to apply. Okay. Do you have any, um, yeah, any advice, recovery advice? How do you counter soreness? How do you uh, treat yourself when, uh, when, uh, you ha when you are sore, when you uh, went too, too, too far? I find that soreness for most people is mainly when they're on a new training program. So when they're doing exercise that they're not accustomed to, or they've done too much training volume too soon. For me and most people, we tend to get sore in the first couple of weeks of starting a new training program. And that's, that's very normal, but over time you aren't going to be as sore, even if you're training harder and progressively overloading as well. So To come back to what you said before, it's not that you're not having a good session because you're not sore. If you are progressing in the medium to long term, that's the best sign of improvement. But for me personally, because I tend to follow a, a plan with similar exercises, the, the soreness isn't really something that I actually get all that often because as I, as I discussed before, it's a pretty, pretty moderate to, to probably higher training frequency that I have. And As a result of that, I'm not going absolutely crazy muscular failure. So I'm not getting that soreness. But in the first few weeks when I'm a bit sore, essentially just rest and recover. Nothing magical. Um, anything else is really transitory in terms of if you want to do massage or, or that type of stuff. Doesn't hasn't been shown to actually reduce or increase the effectiveness of your recovery. It's it's more just psychological just to do something instead of more training <laughs> okay yeah because you I, i was also asking you about the um how is it called the uh putting the glasses here and uh, who suck out the oh the cupping yeah yeah, yeah. the cupping which which looks uh yeah really interesting uh all the the calisthenics <laughs> athletes having the the brown uh the yeah, brown that's when you know you're hardcore when you've yeah. got those on your, yeah <laughs> this guy trades Yeah. So uh, no, I don't know, cold, warm showers, uh, massaging, cupping, like uh, no, nothing from these for you. I'm going to give you the boring answer and it's a gradual increase in training volume. So I don't have to be so sore that I can't train productively and improve. Okay. How many hours do you sleep uh, at night in, in average? I'd say on average eight Yeah. Give or take, give or take half an hour. So, yeah, that's that's the most important thing. What you just raised the question, and I know that people that are listening to Gore Nation are, you like to read the science, and they, I would imagine they are very knowledgeable of all this stuff. Yes, sleep is important. Yeah, hard work, blah blah blah. Don't worry about it. If you're not sleeping, forget it. I think in terms of anything that you're trying to achieve at school, business, training. If you're not getting a full night's sleep, you can't assimilate your knowledge. You can't assimilate your training adaptations. Sleep is number one, I would say. It's up there, man. It's up there. Like you talk nutrition and training, sleep, if you're not getting that eight hours or around that or enough for you, yeah, very important. Sure. It's also an, an, an unsexy uh, topic, like, uh, like I would say mobility or stretching, um, plus sleep like these two things everybody knows i think somewhere yeah. that this it's important um, do, you, do you know why it's because we can't sell it as much yeah so that's 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 just what it's about man we can't sell it easily yeah insane there so there are really good books i think about uh the benefits of of sleep um uh I, i just don't remember it's a white book but uh yeah <laughs> if are... people like listening to the podcast uh, it was matthew walker is doing a lot of stuff on sleep people can check out his stuff on different podcasts um yeah just listen to that man talk about sleep for an hour and just the hard stats he talks about in terms of effects on testosterone physical performance and you'll be like okay i might get that extra hour of sleep instead of going on Instagram or, or YouTube. 
So we will uh, research it and put it in the description, the link, so people can find the podcast. Yeah, interesting. Also, uh, longevity. So if you want to do what you do for, for 20 or 50 years even, uh, I think sleep and mobility are two things that uh, are unsexy, but that help in the long run. Yeah, your listeners are going to be like, oh, man, he's telling me the truth. Come on, I thought there was, <laughs> there's got to be a secret. Nah, it's doing the sleep, making sure your body's healthy. All that stuff is very important. I'm sounding too old. You yeah. should have interviewed me when I was 17. I'd say, let's go train for four hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Also connected to that, your opinion on supplements. Um, how important are they? Um, like not speaking about health supplements, I would say. So if somebody has, uh, I don't know, uh, any, any lack of, uh, of something health concern, uh, health related, but in general nutrition, uh, yeah. supplements. <laughs> there's a handful that work and then there's so many that are just not, not worth it. And you'd have to say that a good whey protein, if you're struggling to hit your protein intake, is just a nice good food supplement that can that can help with your nutrition in terms of muscle building and recovery and whatnot. But for me, for me personally, I keep it really basic. Fish oil, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, magnesium, zinc. They're the main ones based on the research that I've done that are very important for, for men and in particular um, physical function. But other than that, as I always tell people, it's a matter of not guessing in terms of what you're deficient in. Get a blood test. No, no one can tell you what supplement is right for you. So even the ones that I listed just then, you should not listen to what I say unless you back it up with a blood test that shows that you will actually benefit from those. But most people will find that that's a really good base, base to build from because otherwise you're just guessing. And you're just essentially uh, urinating away money without knowing. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, do you have any opinion on, um, yeah, just um, cheat days, uh, nutrition in general? How important is it? Do you only eat clean? Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your nutrition. This is another really good question. Uh, a good analogy that I like to give people is, I keep coming back to this theme. It's probably not a surprise to anyone, just the, the balance and moderation, right? So it's like um, nutrition you can look at in terms of like your finances. You wouldn't go out and blow all your money on one day, or we hope you wouldn't unless you're <laughs> going to Las Vegas or something. Uh, nutrition should be respected and, and treated in a similar way. So it's like you, you want to kind of allocate it in a, in a sensible way because um, – it's going to be better for you physically and mentally that way. So you could say that most of the time I'm eating, I'm eating healthy whole foods, nothing, nothing crazy um, purely because it supports the needs of my training um, in terms of giving me mental clarity, all that stuff. But of course, you know, I, I don't mind eating quote unquote unhealthy foods in moderation, say once, twice a week in a, a small amount usually when with friends or family, because that's probably the best place to do it, to unwind. But yeah, otherwise, hopefully that answers people's questions. No, I don't eat clean 365 days a year. I don't think that's, I don't think that's healthy. I think that the, the moderation approach and that analogy of finances to nutrition is a really good one when you think of going absolutely crazy on a cheat day over the top. Sure. It's also something that I hear a lot of, uh, a lot from old people, really old people uh, that say- What are you saying, uh, Phil? What are you saying, bro? <laughs> no, <laughs> from really old people. So people in the 80s, 90s, um, um, that everything, everything in moderation. So um, yeah, um, which, is, which is definitely uh, something also longevity. Um, a cheat day won't hurt you in your 20s. But I think if you do cheat days regularly in your 20s, um, I think you will feel it when you're 40, 50, 60. I think yeah. then, then the body will show it. And that term is so relative, isn't it? So like one person, a cheat day might be, oh, they're eating a one cookie. 
but to someone else, they might just, as, as you would have known from some other friends, just uh, some people got some stories, huh? Yeah. And you, I don't know, like I sometimes get recommended these crazy YouTubers who eat uh, 20,000 calories in 20 minutes or something. So uh, yeah, right. yeah, that's that's a totally different uh, definition of a cheat day or of a cheat meal even. Um, yeah. Of course. <laughs> um yeah um today uh, like you're um you uh, did your degree in physiotherapy and i think it's something that um makes you special in your field because um calisthenics is such a young sport that there are a lot of coaches and athletes who don't have the degrees that you have um which is not uh judging but um just uh saying it um so um How does it help you today today to create your programs, to coach, to do workshops? Like, um, is it something that um, if somebody is in the somebody in the listeners is aiming towards becoming a coach, becoming a calisthenics, uh, making calisthenics his profession? Is it something that you would recommend today? For me, these days, the physio degree and just my ongoing education after high school, the most important thing it taught me was how to learn how to learn and also how to, I guess, work in a team in terms of working on projects as well. So most of the stuff that I learned as a physiotherapist, I probably apply, geez, you could probably say a fraction of that, a quarter at most, because a lot of the stuff we were learning was dealing with pathologies of people in hospitals that need respiratory care or um, neuromuscular rehabilitation for people that have had strokes. So obviously that's very different to teaching someone how to get better at the planche, for example, right? <laughs> yeah. But but I guess it's, yeah, it's given me that confidence that I can have the, the patience to outline what I want to learn and find the right resources to, to have those answers. And uh, fortunately doing the physio degree aligns with the world that I'm in. Cause I know a lot of other friends who went on to do like a, say like an engineering degree and then they went into health and fitness or something else that's even more irrelevant. But fortunately this isn't too far removed, but yeah, it's definitely given me that uh, extra, I guess, feather in the cap in terms of credibility because it is very competitive on the internet these days. So it's, it's either you've got to be, Uh, a really high performer, so an absolute elite at what you do in terms of world-class skills, strength, or size, or you need to have uh, the credentials to be able to teach it. But in my opinion, what I've been chasing, this is just my view, is trying to have a good balance of all. So I guess what I pride myself on is just having a respectable amount of knowledge, a respectable amount of, I guess, skin in the game in terms of My, my physical attributes and really what has been the most interesting for me with all the physio stuff is what I've enjoyed most is just teaching. I, I, I love that the most. It's just something really gratifying about giving someone else the tools to be able to do the stuff themselves. I guess it comes back to being, you know, 17, calisthenics, 2009, looking on the internet, just hungry for knowledge. Like you just, you can't soak it up enough. And now I guess that's what is really giving me a lot of fulfillment is just doing that to the best of my ability with um, fitness FAQs and the team. Awesome. Yeah. And that's something uh, you just said it. Fitness FAQs doesn't consist anymore. I would say uh, just from, from one, uh, one phase. Uh, uh, but it's like a, a whole team behind it. There are so many things that um, we don't see as uh, from the outside. You do so much with your platform, with your uh, forum, with your uh, email marketing, like really interesting. You bring a lot of values through a lot of channels. So um Make you, maybe you can tell us more. How does a typical day look like in uh, today? Yeah, sure. So it might come as a surprise to people, but working every day isn't necessary in training or in business. So maybe at the start when you're trying to build your business, that's the case. But for me, having intense periods of work followed by focus on training, focus on downtime with leisure, 
is absolutely critical. So for me personally, with, with my role in the team, I work Monday to Friday and I do just a standard eight hour day. But when I'm doing that eight hours, nothing else matters. Like I'm, I'm working. I'm sure it's the same for you, Phil. You're not, you don't want to be distracted. That's your time to improve stuff. Um, usually twice a week we film content and those are the days when my uh, part-time employee videographer Jordan is working alongside and um, yes we film content twice a week the other three days a week I'm either researching content um, planning the content schedule uh, devising stuff for future programs and just on the other days as you can appreciate and any other small business owner, it's just the operation of the business. So the accounting side of things, all that boring stuff we won't get into. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's important though to have a, a business that keeps functioning year after year. So that's the behind the scenes stuff. Well, cool. Um, any specific routines that you have? Like what is the first thing that you do after waking up or something? Morning routine is always a buzzword. Buzzword, yeah, let's get it, get it happening. <laughs> so, so for me, um, because as you, everyone can probably listening can gather, um, focus more on the FAQ side of things and less about me um, these days, but training is still a priority and I really want to get that out the way first so that I don't skip it. So for me, wake up, have a coffee, do my training session, uh, unwind a little bit before work, work, and then afterwards unwind afterwards so my morning routine it's a good question because it's the most important part of the day um, because it can be uninterrupted from things pulling you this way and that way i know that if i wake up first thing i'm not on my phone i'm not tempted to watch tv or do other miscellaneous phone stuff uh training gets done i make my progress uh towards my goals And then I can get on with the other stuff that I want to achieve. Okay. Do you have any uh, nutrition routine like intermittent fasting or, um, yeah? Yeah. So it, it ties in with what I just said with the morning routine. So um, you could say that I would have been fasting from, say, 7 p.m. till, I guess, 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, part of the morning routine is fasted, have the training, Yeah, that, I guess that's it's not something that I believe is superior for getting shredded or losing fat. I'm sure there's people that can argue either way. For me, it's purely schedule. It's just I, I can get up and I can train sh literally straight away within you know, 20, 30 minutes of waking up. Whereas if I had like even a smoothie or something, I have to wait for that to digest. Or if I have a substantial meal, you've got to wait that two to three hours. So just a schedule thing for me. Okay. People also asked if you still practice as a physiotherapist or if uh, the YouTube uh, influencer um, coaching thing is, is the, the main uh, and only uh, profession. Yeah. So just the backstory on my, my physio, uh, formal physio career, if you will. So after I graduated the first year out of um, university, I worked full time. So standard 38 hours whilst working on fitness FAQs. Um, Fortunately, at the time, FAQs had had a few years worth of, of growth, but I, I couldn't justify like doing five years of university and not using it. So I did an extra year of part-time physio and part-time FAQs. So I did two years, I guess you could say, in, in the trenches as a physio. Um, but since 2018, I've been doing this full-time. So A lot of people ask me the question, oh, like, how do you define success or what's success to you? Just being able to do this full time since 2018 and have a business that's still progressing, I, I could say with confidence that I feel successful in that respect. You can take away any monetary value. It's just the ability to choose how you want to spend your time with an occupation that you want everything else equal, if you can answer that question, like even yourself personally, the person listening, you are successful. The dollar amount doesn't matter if it, if it suits the amount you need for your lifestyle, you're winning. Word. 
for me, yeah. also a big part is uh, working with uh, and deciding with the people uh, that you want to work with. Um, so the going to work every day and having passionate people who work uh, on the uh, with the same reason uh, here um, because they can go somewhere else. They uh, they would uh, like uh, also find 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 other jobs, um, but having people who are like also working on the same thing, being passionate, um, this is the best thing coming in the office with a smile. I agree with you 100% because they they essentially your friends if you're having a small yeah. business in that respect because you, you spend so much time together and a really good trait that I look for in, in people that I want to work with myself is if there was a world with no money, would you want to be doing this job? And mm -hmm. I can answer that for myself. Like if, if everything else was equal, well, it practically is now with this COVID situation that we're all, you know, equal in that respect. So yeah. I'm, I'm essentially doing that. I know you'd probably be doing the same thing. True. So it's a good question to ask. Yeah. So yeah, shout out to the fitness FAQs team and uh, to the to the awesome people sitting in the coronation office. So yeah. That's it. Cool. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice for somebody listening who wants um, to make calisthenics their pro his profession, his or her profession? Um, somebody who wants to become a coach. Um, some of the things that you learned along the way. Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, I'd advise because I'm probably a more conservative type of person. Like you could ask this question to two different people. One person will say, "Follow your dreams. Just go for it. Have no safety net." then you're forced to sink or swim. I'm going to be the sensible, you know, I guess like uncle or cousin here that's like recommending you some wisdom is to, I would have something stable and then be working on this on the side because you can still accomplish a lot by having a few things going at once. You realize if something's important to you, you'll find the time to do it a little bit less leisure time a little bit more focused towards this because that way it becomes more pure. I think that if you are really strapped to pay the bills, then the type of content or how you come across is going to be very insincere. And I think your values will be really questioned if like, if you're dependent on eating or not based on the content or the, the brand or whatever that you're going to endorse or, how you're trying to get a lot of clients and not give them the right care because you just need to make money. I don't think that that's sustainable and I don't think it's going to be as effective. So my recommendation is build it slow, see where you need to improve without the pressure of going just all out at once. Well, still sounds good for the, for the uncle uncle. Um, that's uh, <laughs> still so <Uncle>, cool. Uncle. <laughs> That's still some, some, some good advice. Nice. Uh, what I ask myself, uh, do you sometimes get recognized in the street, uh, people asking you for a photo or something? I'm going to be honest. In the past couple of years, it's starting to happen a bit more. And at first, because I'm, I'm a naturally pretty shy, introvert guy, I like to keep it to myself. I'd be very taken aback by it. But these days, I'm a lot more comfortable with it and it – it's I, I enjoy it. It's just really gratifying when people, even if you've taught them one thing, if one thing in their journey has helped them, it's awesome. But definitely like just if I head to the city, I might get a few odd looks from people. I'm like, did I brush my teeth properly today or do I have something on my face? And like <laughs> usually they'll like, yeah, you know when they know it's you. But yeah, it's happening more and more these days, especially in the I guess the gyms and parks and stuff like that. So it's, it's awesome, man. Great. Then the last question of the big part of the interview, uh, what are you currently working on? What can we expect in the next uh, month from you? May it be uh, sports uh, wise, like uh, skills or um, something that you're working on. And on the other hand, of course, what can we expect from fitness FAQs in the, in the next month? So as we discussed in this conversation so far, I've, um, put a shelf to and completed my backbridge process. So really happy with the progress that I've made in terms of hip mobility, uh, back mobility, shoulder opening, all that stuff. And I really want to test the process of gaining that 
flexibility as an adult, especially someone who was very, very tight and um, going to be launching a training program which assimilates all that knowledge called Backbridge Pro. And for those of you that are interested in getting a discount on the FAQs programs, I'm going to be doing a coupon code with uh, Phil here from Gore Nation. So Gore Nation 10 at checkout for fitnessfaqs.com for discount. So that'll be applying to all of our existing programs. But yeah, to come back to what you said, so finished with my mobility goals and now it's going back to basics, man. Going back to what I love most, which is just the calisthenics. So get the get the basics to a respectable level, the way to pulls, the way to dips, nothing fancy. Um, mainly is overhead pressing strength. So I really want to just become a savage again at handstand push-ups, um, 90 degree push-ups. So really building strength with this new mobility that I've got and um, just showing people, I guess, the best of all worlds. It's tough to get the best of all worlds, but it can be, it can be done. You're not going to be absolutely the number one in any particular area, but you're going to have a very, very solid level of strength, size, and skills. So um, I can't wait, man. I've got that real passion back again to get back to my calisthenics audience and show them, show them what's up again, lead by example. Awesome. Nice. It's been an interview full of uh, content. We always have this quick questions, quick answers uh, at the end, this yep. part. So favorite food? Favorite healthy food or favorite junk food? Favorite <laughs> food overall, like uh, junk food, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> It's junk food as always, yeah. <laughs> I know this is one of your questions you usually ask, but I have to say pizza. Pizza, okay. you, can't, you can't go wrong with a pizza. For me personally... Nice chicken barbecue pizza. Oh man, you're getting some, <laughs> getting some proteins, you're getting some carbs in there, some good stuff. Okay, nice. We also have two people here, uh, Andy and Freddie. Uh, like they, when we have a monthly meeting and it was a successful month, we uh, also order pizza for the office. Uh, we do a small cheat meal together. And it's always a barbecue chicken for them. So yeah. Oh man, where's my invite? Where's my invite? Come on. <laughs> Nice. Uh, are you a dog or a cat person? I would say more dog. Yeah, I don't. I don't own any pets. A bit too much of a responsibility. I've seen um, other people that have pets, and it's just a real commitment. It's practically another child. Maybe not so much a cat, but dogs definitely. Sure. Do you have a favorite color? Blue and fitness FAQs orange. Okay. Uh, what athletes inspire you? I would say from the world of calisthenics, we always gravitate towards people who fit similar attributes to us. Um, I would say in terms of just like height, I really like the Vitaly Festchuk. And in particular, the reason why I like him is just because it might seem as a surprise to some people, but it's just because it's such the opposite of the way I train. He's just... <laughs> He just goes absolutely crazy. And, and I love that. It's like, I, I like seeing people that are just giving that just unfiltered, like animalistic passion. And because he's got similar stats ish to me in terms of his like metrics, I, I love it. It's great. It gives me that motivation to be like, all right, I'm going to go do my uh, dips that aren't so heavy now <laughs> and just keep grinding. <laughs> Well, I didn't expect that. Like I, I expected someone like uh, Micha Schulz, for example, like uh, who is also training quite scient scientifically. And he's very good too. I found, yeah, did a podcast with him. He's, he's doing awesome work too, but I had to give you an example that people weren't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So yeah. Um, what do you prefer? Uh, like, would you rather, rather have skills or a great body? If you'd have to I'm going to I'm gonna say great body because that assumes that it has more muscle mass and that muscle mass can be then taught to acquire good skills. <laughs> Sorry for being a smart ass, but I had to do it. <laughs> okay, you worked around the question, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite skill? One arm chin up slash one arm pull up. And I believe that all of us have a favorite skill that suits our anatomy. And I'd say that 
I'm more biased towards pulling. So I've always found front levers easier, um, weighted shins, weighted pulls much easier than obviously the planche. Um, <laughs> you know, dip, dipping's harder. So one arm chin, one arm pull. Cool. That's uh, the next question. Also, pull or push? So, so pull. Pull always. Cool. Uh, but if we are here, um, do you have a one rep max of dips and pull ups? Something uh, it would be interesting, I think, for for me and the the listeners. Yeah, uh, one rep max on the chin up was body weight, about eighty three kilos. I have a video of it somewhere wow. in the archives, and the heaviest weighted dip I can't recall going for a one RM attempt, but in the past, like working sets with around 80 kilos for five by five. Wow. Uh, for, for me, I just feel the dip is a very, like, especially with a one RM, it's pretty risky. Like you've seen a lot of pec tears and people getting AC joint stuff. So I, I'm more conservative with my training. I don't do one RMs that much. I prefer to just build strength in, in a range that's a bit more sustainable. True. Sure. Interesting, but uh, still, thanks for sharing. I, I think these are like great numbers. Um, so um, yeah, definitely, um, definitely cool. Um, if you'd have to decide, weighted or body weight? Definitely weighted. I think for people that get beyond a few years of calisthenics experience, unless they're chasing just extreme numbers for numbers' sake, in terms of high reps or circuit stuff it just becomes a little bit less efficient. Like you have to be doing like two hour workouts to get that volume in, which comes to the question of what you said before, like does 10 to 20 sets work? Well, it could work for weighted calisthenics and you'd be done in a fraction of the time. Whereas if it was just body weight, if you had those lofty goals, then you'd have to spend a large time doing it. So my preference is efficiency, and effectiveness and i prefer the weighted stuff for longevity cool uh, do you have a favorite book for me i am very interested in uh philosophy so definitely the stoicism stuff really resonates with me and a really good place for people to start if they want to read an excellent book is meditations by marcus aurelius it's a fantastic book just in terms of just dealing with the controllables and just, I guess, a lot of the challenges that we have uh, with life and how to, I guess, respond to that from a, from a stoic perspective. Interesting. We just uh, did a few days ago, we did a, um, a, sur a poll uh, on Instagram and asked people um, if they meditate. And I think it was, it was quite uh, interesting because if I remember right, it was something around 35 to 37% of the people did meditate, uh, do meditate. So um, this is quite interesting because it feels like it becomes more and more spread in, in, in calisthenics as well. Just uh, for the people listening, this book isn't about meditating in terms of like closing your eyes and just being still. It's more just on the philosophy of life's challenges. Even though it's called meditations, I believe it's meditating and thinking about the thoughts and challenges of life, not not meditating in the traditional sense okay my bad then uh, forget oh, good. that i just want to clear that out yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay cool um yeah favorite music genre i would say hip-hop and rap music for sure yeah just give it to me all i like you know the 90s stuff i like lyrical rap i like you know just just a hard beat where you can't hear what they're saying <laughs> I, i don't mind i love it cool um, yeah, best calisthenics event uh, you've ever been at so far, or maybe also you've um, best workshop you've given something something like this. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't actually been to a calisthenics workout competition, be it freestyle um, or street lifting. I'd love to someday. Hopefully, if uh, we can travel more freely in the future, I'd, I'd love to attend something like that, just to just to see the level in person. Um, But for me, my most enjoyable workshop experience was in 2019. Fortunately, I was able to travel in that time and I traveled all throughout Europe teaching workshops and had a really, really good turnout in particular in, um, in Germany, oh, in wow. Dusseldorf. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
uh, where was it? What's what was the name of the gym? Uh, oh, you've you've got me again. Um, <laughs> di diet. <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head. It was it begins with die, mm -hmm. and then it gets very German after that. Okay, just for the English <laughs> people, it's it's D. It's uh, not like that somebody has to die. Uh, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excuse my ignorance. Sorry, Ron. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, yeah. Final question of the quick questions. What's your message to the calisthenics community? I guess with the theme of what we've discussed today is enjoy your own journey and enjoy the process of training because you don't realize how much you enjoy everything about it until you do get an injury or you, you can't train for whatever reason if life gets in the way. So just don't take for granted when your body is healthy and you're making progress. Don't get greedy and just look at the long-term big picture of, of what you're doing and reflect on your own progress. Awesome. Great. Thanks for sharing. So, um, yeah, I think you're one of the obvious people when I say, where can people get in touch with you? Where do they find you? It's, uh, it's quite obvious. Um, I think most of the, our listeners already subscribe to you, but still, do, do you want to say how, uh, how can they find you? And also, where do they find um, the, the content where they can learn from you, the programs? Sure. So fitness FAQs on all social media platforms, YouTube, Instagram, etc. Uh, also on the podcast, if you want to check out ours, there's a few episodes there. But uh, main one, if you want to be supporting the brand, go ahead to fitnessfaqs.com. If you're looking for some training programs that will help you with your calisthenics goals. Awesome. We have all the links in the description. Um, also, uh, yeah, to all the social media platforms. I was asking myself, I know I'm a smart kid and in, in terms of social media, I was asking myself, yeah, does he do uh, Snapchat and TikTok? Uh, if he says, uh, yeah. if he says uh, all social media platforms. Hey, it's funny. It's funny you say that because I put a poll out to um, my YouTube community in the community tab. And I said, where do you follow fitness FAQs? And there was like, 70% or something said uh, YouTube and then it dwindled down like less and less to Instagram and then Twitter. And then because I previously just made a TikTok, it was literally 0% after like tens of thousands of people responding, responded to TikTok mm -hmm. after I made one. And the top comment on that was, I've never seen a poll with 0%. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it just goes to show that people, I guess, like digesting the fitness FAQs content in longer form, not rushed, not too flashy. So I am on TikTok though. So you can check out two videos on there if you want. Nice. <laughs> Awesome. Something that I, I can tell you, um, because in the in the questions and in the comments uh, for the interview, we received a lot of um, requests um, for from people uh, asking if you can share more about your personal life, sharing more about the the behind the scenes, etc. And it's something that I just wanted to tell you also in the interview because uh, I think like you have such a an impressive story, such an impressive uh, brand that you've built together with your team that it. It would be so interesting to also have some um, some insights behind the scene. I know it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's like I know this from firsthand because it's uh, if you're sitting in the office with your team every day and you also have like a lot of um, projects to work on, it's quite difficult to to do some stories between in between, etc. And uh, it just feels weird, at least for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to tell you that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that I'm going to start doing more so of. I'm going to challenge myself too because I know that that form of content is going to reach people and help people. It's just that the reason why I haven't done that stuff as much in the past is people that know me that have been following for years know that I really like to make this not about me. I like to teach the concepts that can help you do it. But I know that if I share my own journey, get a little bit vulnerable, be very honest with, I guess, my process. It's going to help other people. So it's something that I'm going to challenge myself to incorporate more into the future amongst the other many hats that I'm wearing too. Sure. 
so yeah good luck with that uh i think people will like it but i know that it, it takes some it takes different work than than usual yeah. so yeah good luck yeah. with that well, thanks phil <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So um, yeah, that's basically it for the interview. I'm extremely happy that you took the time. I, I see that it's, it looks like midnight uh, in your place. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm going to miss my meal here. You're making yeah, me lose, so, lose my gains. <laughs> I'm extremely <laughs> thankful that you took the time that you um, yeah accepted uh, the invite because people requested you since, since month, uh, since the beginning of the podcast. So big thank you um, for that and have a good evening. And uh, yeah, you can end the episode by, by saying goodbye to the people. Um, yeah, quick, quick note. Thanks everyone for watching. I'm extremely happy always. It's been a long podcast or almost one and a half hours. So um, big thanks for listening to this till the end. And so uh, yeah, Daniel, you can, you can end. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening all the way to the end. If you've gotten this far, you have the attention span of an absolute <laughs> soldier. We appreciate you. But I, I appreciate you, Phil, for having me on. You're doing really good work with uh, Gore Nation. Keep building it slowly. Keep building it patiently and doing it in a way that's in, in accordance with your values, which you have been. So that's really good to see, man. Yeah, it was good chatting to you too. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. See ya. Yeah.